Lord Jess, Papi, hit me one time and make it funky. I was brought up and told to have no Welcome to the Full Circle Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, David Roberts, along with the OG, Dr. Neil Holmes, and the oral historian, Andre Taylor. Today, we have a very special guest uh, that has graced us, uh, Mr. Kurt Russell. He is the 2022 National Teacher of the Year. Mr. Russell, how are you doing, sir? I am doing well. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. We really appreciate you joining us. I remember, you know, when I first decided to request your presence, and I had to go through the publicist. I was like, oh man, we might not get picked. You know, we, we, we might not make the cut. So <laughs> I, I appreciate you joining us. Um, why don't we get first, let, let's get into the National Teacher of the Year and, you know, getting that award. And I know, you know, as I told you before, you know, when we were chatting before we started, all of us are in education. Yes. And I know nobody goes into education for accolades. Nobody goes into it to get rich. If we did, we'd be disappointed. <laughs> but how has it been, you know, being that educator and then having this award bestowed on you and just the, uh, I guess, the attention that comes with that? Well, once again, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been a blessing. It really has. Um, you know, being selected as the National Teacher of the Year has really put my message of equity and diversity within faculty and curriculum at the forefront. And I'm just so blessed that I'm able to share my body of work uh, with the nation at this time. But I have to be honest with you, in the beginning, it was this imposter syndrome. Um, no, why me? No, why am I the national teacher of the year when there are so many worthy teachers out there that is doing the great work that all of us are trying to do. And then I just came to my senses and realized that being National Teacher of the Year does not mean I'm the best teacher. And I really take that to heart because I'm not the best teacher. I'm just a teacher who have been putting this work for a very long time and just excited and passionate to share knowledge to my students. Right. This, this just gives you, uh, gives you that platform. It sure does. You know, definitely does. Now, I know as a school counselor, I was having this conversation today um, with one of my fellow counselors, and uh, we were just talking about the struggles of teachers, you know, because we were going in uh, meeting with the seniors and we were just talking to them briefly about, you know, the graduation requirements, what they still need to do, make sure you have your tests together and, you, you know, don't get lazy, don't fail anything. You know, and so we would, you know, we came back and we were talking about just our admiration for teachers, because sometimes we'll be in there for 15 or 20 minutes and maybe get aggravated with a couple of students that are acting up. But we were like, man, the teachers have to be in the classrooms, you know, for, you know, in our school, like an hour and a half block, you know, we and as counselors, we have the privilege of, OK, a student comes in to see us because they want to see us. They're coming to get help. If they don't act appropriately, we can say, hey, man, you got to go get out of this office. But teachers don't have that. So whenever we hear someone um, and sometimes some of our fellow counselors being critical of teachers, you know, I think this teacher isn't this or this teacher isn't that. We always say just think about what they're dealing with, you know. And so with you, what are some of the, the obstacles you see um, within the school district or within your school specifically to you doing your work? Well, I tell you what, I think you really touched upon it. As teachers, we wear so many different hats. Uh, we are moms, we are dads, we are teachers, we are counselors, uh, we are life guidance individuals. And so those many different hats really um, put a burden on teaching um, as a field, but it's a profession that all of us went into with this knowledge that it's gonna be difficult. Um, at my particular school, Oberlin High School, probably the most difficult task that we are facing today is trying to continue the growth of our students coming out of the pandemic. The pandemic has really, you know, stagnated um, the learning process for a lot of our kids and just trying to have our kids, don't want to say catch up, but to improve on their 
academic um, powers, I think it'd be probably the most difficult things we are facing. Yeah. Mr. Russell, uh, first of all, congratulations again. Uh, this is a follow-up to that question. Knowing what all you have to deal with, where you, you, we wear many hats in the classroom, why do you come back? And why, why did you even get involved in education in the first place? Well, I'm glad you really asked that question. It's because I have a love for teaching. I have a passion for the classroom. And I come back every single day because of my students. Uh, my whole pedagogy of teaching is student-centered. Everything that I do, I have to make sure that the students are at the center of everything. And I come back because I'm excited. I love teaching. I love being around kids. So even though there's some difficult days and some hard days, the brighter days most definitely outweighs that. And I'm just so blessed to be in a profession that really transform individual lives. So I keep coming back because I'm excited and I love it. Absolutely love it. When, when did you first know that you wanted to be a teacher? I have a unique story because both of my parents are from Alabama. And every single summer when I was a young child, we visited my grandparents in a small little town called Linden, Alabama in Marengo County. And every establishment I went to, um, every household I went to always had three pictures, a picture of Jesus, a picture of Martin Luther King Jr. and a picture of JFK, um, even on plates on the wall. And I was just curious, like why are these individuals in every place that I go to? And I was fortunate that my parents brought me a little children encyclopedia. And back then when you, I guess research say Martin Luther King Jr. At the bottom, it says, see also. And I used to see also the other stories of individuals connected with Martin Luther King Jr. And that's how I fell in love with history because history is just stories, right? It's just stories and narratives. And I fell in love with it. And then my kindergarten teacher, uh, Miss Francine Toss, gave me a love for learning and my first black male teacher I ever had was Mr. Larry Thomas, uh, my math teacher in the eighth grade. And he gave me that attainable goal that I could become a teacher because I saw myself in him. Representation is so key and it matters so much. You know, and that's interesting that you say that because, and I read that in your bio, and I was thinking the same thing, you know, I, I went to, you know, a predominantly uh, black school district and I didn't have my first black male teacher until the fourth grade. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Patillo, who was a, a recent graduate of Kent State University at that time. And I just, you know, in retrospect, you know, I just found that interesting. And I know a lot of men, uh, you know, it seems like don't necessarily teach at the, the elementary level, mm -hmm. but it just seems like I would have had my first black teacher before fourth grade in a black school district. Most definitely. And um, like I said, I did not receive an opportunity to have a black teacher, a black male teacher into my eighth grade year. And so a lot of our students, um, since they're only 2% of black male teachers in public schools today, a lot of our children um, do not have that opportunity. And I think it's so key um, that all students receive that fair representation in the classroom. So what, what, what can we do to recruit uh, more black male teachers into the classrooms? Because I'm, I'm hearing a trend here because my first black male teacher was in ninth grade when I had Albert Hill uh, <laughs> at Ben Franklin High School for health. All before that, I had black women as teachers from first grade all the way up. But my first experience seeing a black male in the classroom wasn't until I got to high school. You know what? I believe there's several things that we can do to recruit um, Black male teachers. Number one, I think we have to put a respect on education that is not there today, right? I don't think teachers are valued. I don't think teachers are respected. I should, should not just say teachers, but um, educators. Um, and so there's a couple of things. Number one, pay doesn't hurt right? Uh, I think pay is important. And there's this dichotomy where people think if teachers or educators ask for pay, then they are going against student needs. 
And I think otherwise, I think teachers have to be socially, emotionally, and financially well in order to do their best job. So pay is one. Um, what about free tuition, right? If you are a black male going to education, what about that? I think that could help as well. And there has to be some type of grassroots pipeline where someone like me, Kurt Russell, could look at someone in my classroom and say, hey, I see potential in you. I think you could be a great teacher. Let me see if I could model um, that profession for you. Let me see if I could offer you some advice into the field. But there has to be some type of value on the profession in order for people to want to say, hey, this is something I really would like to do one day. You know, I just want to echo that sentiment. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I had the opportunity to be a camp counselor for students that were in the sixth grade in my feeder school. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the teachers that were a part of that program were, were my former middle school teachers that I had good relationships with. And after that camp counseling experience, I loved it so much. I told one of my uh, former teachers, you know, I think I might want to go into education. He, he talked me out of it. <laughs> you wow. know, he said, he said, do something else, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And then it's funny that educate education doesn't even value education. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. My uh, former high school, um, we have a hall of fame, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not jockeying for the hall of fame, anything like that, <laughs> but you know, everybody that gets inducted is like uh, in corporate America, yes. banking, see, and I'm, you know, not bragging on my record, but I've been a um, regional director um, for uh, Pennsylvania State, a higher education agency. I've been accept, assistant executive director um, for an agency in Louisiana, you know, a track record in education, but I've never gotten that call, you know, <laughs> and I'm not expecting it, don't really care, but I'm, it's just interesting to me. Um, and recently, we, uh, at the district I'm in, we have a new black female uh, superintendent that came from Chicago. And the first thing she did was increase everyone's pay by 7%. So wow. next year, we're going to be do doing a, you know, a little bit better. But yeah, it's still a long way to go. It, it is. And like you said, um, the teacher profession is not valued. Teachers are not even considered experts in the classroom with all of these policies and politicians um, really dictating what could be taught, what could be read in the classroom. It really takes away from that, from the profession of educators. How is that um, critical race theory kind of debate? Is that affecting your school or your it, district? It's it really not. I am fortunate that I, I teach in Oberlin, and oh, okay. I'm not sure if you heard of Oberlin College. Oh, yeah, I've been to Oberlin. Okay. And hang so, out, I used to hang out at the pond. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly where you are at. <laughs> so Oberlin, of course, is founded on the principle of equity and equality and fairness. The first college to admit uh, Black students and women and co-education. And so... I like to consider my school as being very progressive and right. very liberal. Um, and so, of course, we really disregard critical race theory. I mean, we mm -hmm. just, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not even a part of our language and yeah. it's something that we really say that we don't do. Now, if, if, if I remember Oberlin properly, because I used to, uh, do quite a few things at the college itself, College of Oberlin. Mm -hmm. And um, at the college, you had uh, kind of an upper middle class type of clientele. But the city itself or the town itself, I remember, was a largely black working class town. Um, and, uh, you know, how is that uh, campus, I mean, high school relationship with the campus? Is that um, do you get resources from them? Is that helpful at all? Oh, most definitely it is. Um, our science classes go to the college and use their labs. Oh, okay. um, I co-taught with Professor Carol Lasser, and we taught a class that was called uh, um, Oblin History is American History. Mm -hmm. And so we really put this joint effort um, together. And a great benefit is that every Oblin High School student 
who is accepted to Oberlin College is tuition free. Wow. Okay. Yes. And so we have a great town gown relationship um, that works very well for us. Okay. So with, with, with that in mind, how many students actually take advantage of, of that opportunity? We have a very small school. And so our graduating class is probably 80 to 85 students and roughly maybe six or seven students um, take advantage of that. So it's close to like 10% of, our, of the senior class that take advantage of it. So it's a pretty large group of students who decide to go to Oberlin College. Hmm. Now, now, oh, my, go ahead, Doc. Yeah, yeah I, I wanna stick my, my first male teacher was in the sixth grade. Uh, and I came up during that uh, period before integration. I mean, in fact, my class, I think was the last class before integration of the schools. Mm -hmm. And our teachers were, um, many of them were in the community. We knew them and so, so forth. And they had taught, you know, many of them had taught at that same school for forever. Now, I think you mentioned before uh, we got started, you had been teaching there, what, 29 years or so? 25. 25 years. Yes. And and so you've you've actually, taught children of some of your old students I, I sure and have. grandkids <laughs> and so how does that so you are you are a, a, a centerpiece of the community uh, how does that work in terms of education is that a plus oh it's most definitely a plus because i don't think you could have a quality educational institution without having community involvement so i live in the town I shop at the same grocery store as my students and parents. Um, I, I attend the same church as some of my students and parents. And so they see me on a different level as well. Just not Mr. Russell as a teacher, but Mr. Russell as a community member as well. And from there is a sense of connection that I believe I have with my students. And like you said, sir, um, some of my students that I have, I had their parents. Um, their parents, siblings, uh, were good friends of mine. And so it's more like a family instead of a teacher-student relationship. Now, Mr. Russell, when I was reading the announcement that you were you know, selected Teacher of the Year, um, they mentioned that you had created a class, uh, uh, Gender, Race, and Discrimination, I believe. Race, Gender, and Oppression. Race, Gender, and Oppression, thank you. And then as I read your application, I saw you actually created three classes. Yes. You know, so I wanted to talk about uh, the gender, race, and oppression class. Was that the first one you created? It was the second. The first one was African American history class. Okay. Well, since, since that was the first one you created, African American history, uh, can you take us through that process? Like when you first uh, introduced it, any objections you received, so on and so forth? Well, it's an interesting story as well, because it was really the movement started with students. Um, students came up to me and said, you know what, Mr. Russell, uh, there's information within these textbooks that we are studying that is not reaching us, right? Uh, when we study the Revolutionary War and other historical events, it seemed as though we are missing a large segment of America, especially the accomplishments of Black people here in the United States of America. And so students say, hey, can we have a little bit more? I started the course African American history probably in 1999, 2000, around that time. And honestly, it's probably one of the most popular courses at the high school, not because necessarily I'm teaching the class, it's because it presents a different narrative and students have a sense of belonging. In terms of pushback, absolutely not. The school board was on it. Uh, the principal at the time uh, gave me her blessing, say go for it. And it has really changed the whole climate and culture of the school. Hmm. Doc, you were gonna ask something? Well, I, I was just excited about that. Now, um, how many of your students have gone on it to, to go into the teaching profession? Have, have, have many of them uh, gone on and, and, and um, followed in your footsteps? You know, there's been education? a, yeah, there've been a few. Um, not a large group of students, um, but there's been probably maybe seven to 10 
mm -hmm. that went into education. Matter of fact, there's two at the high school right now that are my colleagues that used to be students as well. Okay. Yes. Now, can we talk about race, gender, and oppression? Like when you started that, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about that course. Yes, and so that course was started around 2005 and 2006. African-American history class, of course, um, main focus is on the accomplishment, celebration, struggle of Black people. But then I thought to myself, what about women? What about the LGBTQ plus community? Uh, what about, um, you know, poverty issues in our country? So I created this course to really try to tackle different other segments of our society. So that particular class deals with five to six units, a unit on women's studies, a, women, a unit on the gay rights movement, a unit on immigration, a unit on economic oppression. And so my thought process was I need a course where everyone mm -hmm. could feel a sense of belonging, where young girls in my classroom could feel a sense of belonging. Um, I have some students who are immigrants that are in Oakland High School, a sense of belonging. And so that was my thought process. That course has really um, challenged myself as a teacher. It has challenged students because it's a lot of debates in that particular class and a lot of discussions that are emotional. I have to make sure that there's a safe space for my students to have those conversations. Now, I'm, I'm sure that's challenging because I know uh, I have to tell students all the time, just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean, you know, they get emotional. Yes. yes. A lot of adults do too, that think if someone doesn't agree with them, they don't like them or, you know, so on, so on and so forth. Yes. But I'm curious, how often um, do you teach that class? Is it every day? It's every day. It's a semester course that runs correspondence to African-American history class. So I have African-American history class one semester and then the following semester, I'll have race, gender, and oppression. So you're teaching race, gender, and oppression currently? Yes, I'm sorry. I have race, gender, and oppression last semester this year in okay. the African-American history class this semester. And the reason I asked is because I was wondering what was your students' reactions if they, you know, uh, as far as discussion to the shooting in Buffalo. Yes, um, we had a discussion today in African American history class. Um, we just finished studying uh, the Black Panther Party. And we had a small little debate in class in regards to which movement would be more beneficial today, whether it be the nonviolent movement of King or that more reactionary movement of the Black Panthers and Malcolm. And then a student talked about Buffalo and the aspect where if the murderer maybe would have taken courses that dealt with marginalized groups, maybe there could be a different situation there. Um, it's so important in my opinion that every single student across this country takes a cultural class. Um, it does nothing but enhance our respect, our knowledge of different groups. And a lot of times we have adults, especially adults who are so blinded by color, about gender, about sexual orientation, where that hatred builds up because they've never been exposed to the greatness that this country could present if we all welcome diversity. Now, what, what, what sort of challenges, I mean, uh, did you have during this um, uh, pandemic? Because um, it seemingly in this area, I'm in uh, Richmond, Virginia, mm -hmm. and seemingly, um, you know, there uh, uh, kids coming back into the schools, um, they tend to be, there tend to be, it tends to be a, quite a bit more um, uh, social, um, you know, social problems with socialization and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And, and also some parents not wanting to bring their kids back into school yet. Mm -hmm. um, 
and you know how do you see that as um and how does that feed into this question of dealing with questions of gender race uh class and 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 and, and so forth yeah and like you said um all those things that you mentioned we are experiencing it um you know the socialization of our kids we have freshman students who have not been in school for what two years until this year um, and so really they middle school children in terms of their mentality because they have not been to the high school yet um, and so there's a lot of things that we are struggling with um, in regards to our students academically trying to keep them apart um, and so the struggle is a maturity issue. And so when we talk about race and class, there's a lot of, I'm so uncomfortable speaking about it. And so allow me to make a joke, allow me to laugh because that's my defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. And so the maturity level really has to get a little bit better, has to improve uh, before we can have those really impactful discussions that we used to have. Um, before the pandemic, race, gender, and oppression was, of course, that was just moving. Tough conversation. Um, students used to stay after class because we were so engaged in the lesson. Right now, we're trying to get back there. Um, I think we will, of course, but it takes a little time because our kids have missed so much. And social media, how does that impinge on, on what you're doing? It, it did, uh, a French a lot because a lot of my students receive their news from social media. You know, what's on Twitter and Facebook is the gospel to most of my students. And what I have to do as a teacher is to meet my students where they are and then introduce them to some more scholarly, if I could say, resources so they can have a better uh, understanding of the topic that we are studying. You've met with a lot of resistance because of that, because I, a lot of a lot of young folk believe that what's said on social media is, is absolute truth. Right? Yep, like a lot of pushback on that. Um, most definitely, um, you no know, kids, you know, even when they walk through the hallways, they have their cell phones out looking, trying to find out what's the latest gossip, and then you have to make sure you turn their attention um, to the work at hand, especially. As a teacher, we I have to introduce my students to, to, to scholarly works. Like I said, um, you know, it can't be about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram for your information or Wikipedia. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, Mr. Russell and, and Doc and Dre, y'all just, you know, I have so many questions, so y'all have some just cut me off and cut in. <laughs> but I was reading the bio and I was reading the application. Uh, that you submitted, and the one one of many things that struck me, but uh, was the program you started um, for young African American men to kind of like impact the way they see themselves. Yes, the Black Student Union. Yes, the Black Student yes. Union. Yes, and it, and it, it was just that that was so interesting to me because even back when I was Dre's counselor, you know, mm -hmm. over twenty years ago, twenty five. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, 25. You had to throw that in there. Make that take that dig, right? <laughs> there were students that wanted to be thugs, yes. you know. And that's I still see that, you yes. know. And I get it. Girls kind of like the bad boy. You want to be seen as tough. You don't want to be seen as soft, so on and so forth. But that thug persona can go too far and it can take you into a, a, a place you don't want to go. Um, so what brought about what did you see that made you want to do that? Once again, similar to African American history class, it was several students. As a matter of fact, it was a young black girl and a white girl that it was the response to the George Floyd murder. And students were visibly upset, especially these two students. And they said, Mr. Russell, what can we do? What can we do? Um, and so we thought about it. And then I recall when I was a student at college, I belonged to our Black Student Union. And that really helped me to really understand racism in America and to really understand myself as a Black person living in America. You know, being around other Black folks 
uh, really empowered me. I said, you know what? Let's see if we could start a Black student union. And we did, and um, students came out, and there's a couple of, don't say criteria, but a couple of things that we stress. We have a dress up day, what we call it, on, on Wednesdays, just to get kids out of, you know, the saggy jeans, get them out of, you know, don't want to say the normal wear, but to try to be a little more, if I could use the word professional, right, to dress up a little bit so they could feel a little more comfortable when they go to job interviews. Um, we have monthly meetings with our local police department. Um, and our local police department put a advisory group with our Black Student Union, where now our students is on a little advisory board to really help the police officers in regards to having this conversation. And so it has really been a great benefit, not only for the high school, but for the community as well. And I also see a change in behavior in grades because we hold each other accountable. And we have white students in our organization. Yeah, which is so, you know, important to me that these white students feel as though this organization is so important, is so needed that we would like to join as well. And I just wanna make two points about that. I, I think that's so important. For one, you mentioned the white students. And I know I've seen, I watch a lot of interviews on YouTube and I've seen members that people that were former members of the KKK and they say what brought me out of it was the love and compassion that black people showed yes. when somebody got angry with me I just dug in deeper you know like we most of us do we have that defense if you know they're saying all these racist things a black guy comes at them hard and they just come harder yes. you know they say when people showed them some compassion that's what got them to thinking and gotten them to move on um, and another thing I like that you said was just, you know, having that dress up day, um, because I think it's important for young people to see that basically, you know, as you move out of your environment with your peer group, it's going to be uh, certain things that you're going to have to do that, you know, for example, when a student emails me and they say, I was wondering what um, I have to do today or something as far as testing or something. And I'm like, I'm wondering where my good morning, Mr. Roberts is. I That's never... Right. I never answer the question. I always go, go back with, you know, excuse me, you know, yeah. and it's not like I'm personally insulted. I know they're just asking me a question and they, they're very respectful, mm -hmm. but I'm just letting them know eventually they might move on from me, somebody, Mr. Roberts, who knows them and cares about them yeah. to happen to email a college professor that they really don't know because that professor has 300 students in his class or following up for a job interview. So yeah. I feel like it's my responsibility to just, you know, do that little piece. Yeah, and, and what I love about that is because you are teaching them. And a lot of times we take for granted and we think that kids know how to write a email or, um, and they, they might not know. And so I'm glad you mentioned it that you are giving them advice along the way and to teach them what to do. Appreciate that. Doc, I see you bubbling up. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I used to... Um... I used to work in a program where uh, we recruited young uh, uh, black men to become teachers. Mm -hmm. And and while I was in that program, we had to look at some of the trends in education, public school education. And one of the things that I found kind of alarming was the fact that you have so many people with lots of money who are trying to destroy the teaching profession. They want to privatize Mm -hmm. public education. They want to um, uh, get rid of teachers in the classroom, have everything sort of digital and online, and you have, have this canned education where the teacher becomes not a, a professional, but just a person who just uh, runs the uh, PowerPoint or, uh, or, or, you know, or, uh, streams, whatever someone else produces. Are uh, you seeing any of that sort of uh, stuff in, in education? Uh, Yes, um, we have online classes now where if students are not successful in a typical classroom, they are able to take an online class where we have a room with computers, we have a teacher who just clicks on 
the assignment, and then students are working independently on those assignments and completing a module um, for them to graduate. So yes, I do see a change in education where it's becoming more uh, virtual instead of having that personal connection, which there's no way in my humble opinion that a computer generated module education is on the same plane as a physical teacher in the classroom. And it's more than just being able to expound at information, it's that human touch that is so important, that caring, that love, that passion, that excitement, that only a teacher um, could bring to a classroom, not a computer. I agree 100%. You know, we have a cosmetology program at our school. And so when we were all virtual, um, I was talking to the cosmetology program coordinator and um, I was saying to her, well, I, I know this is terrible for you all, you know, being virtual. And she seemed to get kind of offended that I said that. Um, and she was like, oh no, we're going to be creative and we're going to do this and that. And I wasn't questioning her uh, creativity or her expertise. I was just saying there are certain things that just cannot be recreated can't. virtually. And I think a cosmetology class, is especially yes. girls are, you know, hands on, hands on. Mm -hmm. you know, I was like, that just cannot be recreated virtually. I don't care how intelligent you are. That's you know? right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and that, you know, discussion in class is so important. Um, I always teach from a Socratic method where, you know, I ask questions, we discuss in the classroom. Um, and that allows students, as I said earlier, allows students to have their own voice and to allow students to feel a sense of belonging and a sense of worth. And it's hard for me, like I said earlier, a computer only could do a certain amount of things and that's it. Now, as, as the National Teacher of the Year, um, you, you know, what does that give you a platform? What uh, what comes along with that uh, award? Um, in regards to financial, nothing. <laughs> uh, it's a opportunity really for me to express my body of work, which is to bring more diversity in education in regards to faculty and curriculum. So when I say diversity in faculty, I mean uh, more teachers of color, more women in STEM, more men in the primary years. Mm -hmm. When I'm looking at curriculum, I'm meaning more cultural courses, more African-American history classes, more native studies, more Asian and Pacific Islander studies. Uh, more women's studies. And so we need to make sure that education uh, reflects our students, okay? That European, Eurocentric education of the 1920s and 1930s has to step aside a little bit and we have to get more uh, culturally aware. You mean of the 2000s? I remember when, when my son was in the first grade, he's a ninth grader now, and he came home telling me, that George Washington was awesome. I'm like, okay, hold up. You know, we, we got to have a conversation here, you know, and we had that conversation. <laughs> so yeah, they're still kind of teaching in that way. Now, Mr. Russell, hey, we definitely in, in enjoying the conversation, but I know we can't keep you forever. So <laughs> let me throw one last question at you and we could, we could wrap up. What do you see as the trends in education? Where do you see education going say, maybe the next five or 10 years? I see a great movement education. Um, like I said earlier, the vision of education is hopefully one of a anti-racist pedagogy, um, a anti-sexist pedagogy. I think that really has to be the center of our education. Uh, more cultural um, courses, uh, more staffing of individuals of color, more women, more men, like I said earlier in the primary years. And so that's where I see education going, but it takes bravery to do so. And when I said bravery, um, you know, Nelson Mandela had this quote, and I don't want to, you know, I don't know it word for word, but he said something that you have to be 
that if we are brave enough, we could change the dynamics of education. And I really believe that is true, that it takes all of us to really be invested in students, in the wholeness of students, to make sure that they receive that quality education that they deserve. Hey, well, on that note, we definitely want to thank you for taking the time to join our little podcast. We got the National Teacher of the Year, you know, <laughs> it's, it's like an accomplishment for us. We, uh, you know, appreciate all your insight and wish you continued success as you go through your uh, National Teacher of the Year campaign. And I'll be following you uh, just to see what's going on with you. I really appreciate the three of you and thank you so much for all that you do in regards to education. Um, if you need me, please, let's reach out and let's keep in touch. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Take care. Lord Jess, Papi, hit me one time and make it funky. I was brought up and told to have no head.